I'm Charlotte Mew, the Decadent Cat, and I'm here to tell you all a bit about decadence in the fin de siècle. To start with, you're probably wondering, what is the fin de siècle, and why is it pronounced like that? Well, despite the spelling, it's pronounced fan, not fin, because it's the French for end and has nothing to do with sharks. The pearl phrase fin de siècle translates as end of the century, the century in question being the 19th, which, just in case you've forgotten, refers to the end of the Victorian era. And now you're probably wondering why it's French. Well, the phrase reflects the origins of the contemporary cultural movement and its associations with mid-19th century decadent symbolist and naturalist French writers and artists such as Charles Baudelaire, Henri Toulouse-Lautrec, and Théophile Gaultier, who we'll say more about later. Just to clarify, naturalism is the belief that nothing exists beyond the natural world and is not the same as naturism, which advocates casual social nudity. Anyway, this end-of-the-century mentality brought with it an end is nigh apocalyptic feeling of anxiety which sprang from the belief that the advancement of civilizations will inevitably lead them to decline, decadence, and social degeneration, just as a blossoming flower will soon begin to wilt and lose its petals. The term decadence in itself has origins in another language, this time the Latin decadare, meaning to fall away, which explains why it was originally used to describe a society in a state of decay, falling from health and prosperity to physical and ethical ruin. The Latin origin ties the phrase to the last days of ancient Rome, which were also associated with perversity, artificiality, enhanced beauty, and, again, decay. It has been argued that the collapse of Rome came about as a direct result of its intense decadence, and the feeling of reckless abandon emerging from a civilization which has reached its peak and cannot progress any further. Despite this potential for decline, many people living in England at the fin de siècle began to imitate these Roman excesses and transgress the boundaries of acceptable behaviour as a way of overcoming the pessimistic boredom, cynicism and dissatisfaction which many felt at the time, generally referred to using the French term ennui. From this attitude emerged the cultural zeitgeist of decadence. Zeitgeist meaning spirit of the age as opposed to poltergeist which is a spirit that will never take your furniture and rearrange your cupboards. Nowadays, people use terms like decadent or decadence, the most likely referring to a large chocolatey chocolate cake with extra chocolate, which, needless to say, is not exactly what the Victorian decadent individuals had in mind. Yet, as we shall see, isn't entirely missing the point. Decadents were keen to live through as many experiences as possible. When you have a mindset like this, though, there isn't much time to dwell or reflect upon consequences. The feeling may be better expressed through the use of analogy. The late Victorian era saw the invention and emergence of cameras, and this led to a transition from oil paintings to photographs as a popular medium for some individuals to capture moments in their lives. While painting with oil was a slow process which took careful planning and consideration to produce a lasting image, photographs presented brief moments which could be appreciated for their transience before the subjects move on to find new moments. Those who embraced decadence believed in living life by these brief moments of pleasure, with more of a photograph mentality than that of an oil painter, moving on to find and experience more moments without time for reflection. Decadent individuals, such as Oscar Wilde's character Dorian Gray, seem to be making up for the monotonous decades of Victorian life, revitalising their individual lives with little thought for morals or consequences. Because to them, enjoying these moments, even if they might be viewed as deviant, was better than acquiescing to the mundane, everyday reality of an industrialised society. This feeling brought with it a culture of egoism and conscious self-indulgence in what was considered to be sinful behaviour, which sort of brings us back to that decadent chocolate cake, the sort of thing which makes people say, Oh, I really shouldn't, but I'll be a little bit naughty, go on, I'll have a slice. Wilde's Dorian Gray pushes us as far as real corruption and debauchery, experimenting with opium and what Wilde hints to be other diabolist explorations into evil and immoral sensations. He never directly lists Dorian's exploits, allowing the reader to fill in the gaps which therefore cleverly takes them on their own wild, speculative and imaginary sinful adventures. As sensuality was the raison d'etre of the decadent individual, if something was forbidden, then it just intensified its appeal by adding a transgressive energy born from sin. Sin was considered by decadent individuals to be one of the best ways to escape from ennui, and you can understand why this philosophy became a little bit controversial. While indulging in the naughtiness of sin, which brings us back to that chocolate cake again, are you feeling hungry yet? <laughs> These decadent individuals were tacitly displaying a belief in the moral code, which creates an ambivalent relationship between inherent morality and deliberate divergence. The decadence gained energy from its measured lack of morality because, well, those who embraced it had a lot of fun, a sentiment expressed by Oscar Wilde's character Dorian Gray, who says, You'll always be fond of me. I represent to you all the sins you have never had the courage to commit. He confuses lack of morality with courage a little bit, but you get the point which Wilde is trying to make here, that sin is an aspirational thing. If only you can abandon the socially enforced morals which hold you back, then you can have a fabulous time. 
Of course, Dorian's sins catch up to him in the end. Before then, he has a great time running around London, becoming as disreputable as possible. Of course, with so much richness and indulgence involved, decadence was expensive, and not everyone in late Victorian society could afford to live the decadent lifestyle. But the cultivation of the unnatural gave those members of the bourgeoisie that desired to seek it fresh, exciting sensations, and opened the pathways to new realms of being. Decadence became a way of fulfilling escapist wishes, allowing individuals to seek pleasure in daily life through sexuality, passion, sickness and cruelty, which is why many critics objected to it, calling the moral responsibility of art into question for glamorising this immoral lifestyle. A man named Max Nordau, who incidentally had quite a fabulous beard, described this decadent, sinful, fan de siècle attitude as the impotent despair of a sick man who feels himself dying by inches in the midst of an eternally living nature, blooming instantly forever. That's a good sentence to remember, as it seems to go on forever too. He suggested that this mentality was like a disease based in unbounded egoism and, secondly, impulsiveness, because according to him, indulgence is a sign of imminent death. He may have a point there, as an awareness of the imminent end of the century may be seen to parallel the imminent deaths of individuals who seek out indulgence at any cost because they have nothing to lose. If you're going to die tomorrow, you might as well have another slice of that cake. Either way, Nordau clearly didn't approve of the Im unhealthy, immoral acts of those involved. The conscious deviance of these decadent individuals in late Victorian society linked its way into the artwork and writing of the time. They achieved sensory experiences through a Roman-inspired indulgence in things which had an aesthetic value, particularly those of artificially enhanced beauty. This creative energy reflects more of a basis in decay than an opposition to it, one example being their preference for the scent of perfume over the flowers which it was made from, as it's more intense and evocative. This was something of a perverse and groundbreaking concept for the time, as many authors, and poets in particular, used to romanticise nature with a capital N to convey a sense of nostalgic longing. For a decadent, however, cultivating the natural achieved a higher level of feeling which took precedence over the traditional hunger for simplicity at one with nature. Sorry, Wordsworth. But in fact, many of the earlier poets would have been turning in their graves at the thought of that which were put forward by these aesthete decadents. All those Andrew Marvell types who lamented about the strange perfumes tainting the natural scent of roses and expressed a distaste for the way in which the flowers themselves, meaning women, were taught to paint, meaning slap on the makeup. The decadent individuals delighted in breaking this convention. In order to be a true decadent, one must abandon long-standing ideals and truly embrace aesthetic and olfactory artificiality in direct conflict with the dominant culture. Because of this desire for intense sensory indulgence, many works of the time used a stylistic technique called synesthesia, which sounds a bit like a disease, but actually refers to the stimulation of one of the senses resulting in the experience of another. For example, if you smelled a rose and you tasted something sweet in your mouth, that would be synesthesia. So you can essentially multitask and feel multiple sensations simultaneously. Baudelaire, one of those French fellows I mentioned earlier, the slightly scary looking one, claimed that by making use of these sensory correspondences, as well as those between this reality and a transcendent one, poets could capture the meaning of their souls. Whether or not you want to take it that far, it's clear that synesthesia's appeal stemmed from the desire to experience as many vibrant sensations as possible. Some examples of prominent writers from the decadent canon who displayed these sinful and sensory themes are Arthur Simmons, Oscar Wilde and Ernest Dowson. Of course, there are many female writers too, decadent discourse was not exclusively masculine. I've just chosen to focus on these few. Apologies for the gender bias, Mrs Pankhurst. Let's start with Arthur Simmons. I've read through his article from Harper's Magazine called The Decadent Movement in Literature and picked out a couple of good bits so you don't have to. If you're interested, then you should definitely still read it anyway because it's really interesting. But if you don't have time, then here are some useful quotes. Decadence is an intense self-consciousness, dot dot dot, a spiritual or moral perversity. In talking of self-conscious perversity, Simmons sums up the spirit of the movement for you in one simple line. Another useful comment of his is, This representative literature of today, interesting, beautiful, novel as it is, is really a new and beautiful and interesting disease, dot dot dot. Healthy we cannot call it, and healthy it does not wish to be considered, dot dot dot. For its very disease of form, this literature is certainly typical of a civilization grown over-luxurious, over-inquiring, too languid for the relief of action, too uncertain for any emphasis in opinion or in conduct, dot dot dot. A spiritual and sensory debauchery, dot dot dot, delights of the artificial. Note how many times he uses words like over and to to suggest the sensory excess which was going on. Again, he mentions the same disease thought that Nodau expressed, if you remember him. So it's another good quote to have in mind. 
And now I'm going to say more about our friend Oscar Wilde, a decadent icon who summed up the aesthetic aspect of decadent mentality through The Decay of Lying from 1891, in which the character Vivian states, The more we study art, the less we care for nature. And this is because, according to Wilde, what art really reveals to us is nature's lack of design, her curious crudities, her extraordinary monotony, her absolutely unfinished condition. Although he's personifying late nature like Wordsworth would, he's expressing the decadent sentiment we discussed earlier, namely the way in which art is infinitely more exciting, vibrant and appealing than anything found in the natural world, which directly con contradicts the usual nostalgic ramblings. And here's another one for you. Lying, the telling of beautiful, untrue things, is the proper aim of art. All art is immoral. When Vivian, reading out an essay he has written, declares that art is immoral, it is again presented as an aspirational thing rather than a label to put people off. This goes back to the decadent consciousness of sin which we mentioned before, tying together the aesthetic and sinful aspects of decadence into one convenient quote. The way Wilde phrases this suggests that in order for things to be truly beautiful, then they must necessarily be untrue. For him, the untrue and immoral are simply a gateway to a higher level of feeling. A guide to decadence at the fin de siècle would be incomplete without mentioning The Yellow Book, a quarterly literary periodical which acted as a representative icon of avant-garde, decadent writing during its publication between 1894 and 1897. It wasn't the only one of its kind around in the 1890s, it is possibly the most famous and most notorious. If you've ever heard of the phrase, the yellow 90s, that's actually a reference to this yellow book, and not to the Simpsons in the 1990s. The magazine itself featured a mishmash of decadent poetry, short stories, essays, illustrations and reproductions of portraits and paintings. It was groundbreaking for a number of reasons, not least because it frequently included work by women such as George Egerton, and even a short story by my namesake Charlotte Mew. The bright bold colour yellow was chosen by the creators as it drew attention to the materiality of the thing. It could be admired for its aesthetic charms without even being opened. You can just picture those vibrant yellow spines sticking out amongst the drab, conventional books on a shelf, giving the magazine an air of dissipation to match that of its readership. It became symbolic of the opulence, anti-realism, excessive artistic detail and visual decadence at the time, just a little bit deviant like its readers. The colour also associated it with illicit French fiction of the period, like that alluded to by Wilde as having a corrupting influence on Dorian Gray, as in Paris at the time such books were wrapped in yellow cloth as a warning, a bit like an age rating certificate on modern films, to let everyone know that it was a little bit naughty, and the yellow book itself was cloth bound. This controversial reputation probably helped to fuel its success. It's worth noting that our friend Oscar Wilde never actually wrote for the magazine. In fact, he really hated it, describing it as not yellow at all upon its publication. As we can see that, well, it definitely is yellow, we can assume that what he's referring to is actually the decadent yellow spirit which it represents, which he felt it seemed to lack. He clearly felt that the yellow book itself wasn't quite shocking or radical enough to be considered a truly decadent medium. However, when Wilde was arrested in 1895, accused of sodomy, he was seen holding a book with a yellow cover. People assumed that this was a copy of the yellow book, but although it was actually one of those yellow-covered French novels I mentioned, the newspapers reported otherwise. This caused a bit of trouble for the magazine, which probably made Wilde ecstatic. If you flick through an early copy of the yellow book, then you couldn't fail to notice the strange illustrations which ran through it. These were a key aspect of the yellow book, and were particularly controversial in themselves. If you're wondering who is responsible for the weird black and white drawings which have been popping up throughout this video, then Aubrey Beardsley is your man. His work didn't exactly fit with what you'd call the Victorian artistic ideal. For a generation which allegedly thought that a cheeky glimpse of ankle was borderline indecent, his deliberate inclusion of inappropriate details within his undeniably grotesque images was never going to be embraced by the majority. In fact, the editors often had to look at each of his images upside down before publishing them to check that there were no secret rude bits hidden within them. It's hard to tell whether Beardsley was trying to send subliminal messages, or if he just thought it was pretty funny to create controversy, mix things up a bit and revel in the shock aesthetic of decadence, but either way, they definitely tended to slip through the cracks. As I mentioned, his work was characterised by this bold use of black and white, the instantly recognisable strange blank expanses and intricately detailed features, the freakish ugly faces and sexual themes. And as if he wasn't satisfied with drawing these terrifying little imps and things, the world's most phallic archways as well, he enhances the viewer's discomfort by including figures which make direct, knowing eye contact with them. In this way, they sort of break the fourth wall, each one looking you in the eye and saying, yeah, check this out, we both know what's going on here. 
And why do you think they're encouraging you to conspire with them and enjoy the sexual references and indulge in the decadent awkwardness? Or agreeing at your discomfort is up for you as the viewer to interpret? Either way, when you observe the picture, you become part of the action, whether you're willing to or not. And they're made to feel as though your own deviance is being exposed. If you remember I mentioned Oscar Wilde allowed the readers of Dorian Gray to speculate upon their own sins by leaving his descriptions deliberately vague, you see a bit of a trend emerging here, of almost tricking and encouraging the reader to become involved in their decadent ways. There was much speculation about Beardley's own decadent sexual preferences. Rumours at the time suggested that he was in an incestuous relationship with his older sister, Mabel, with no one knows for sure whether or not this was true. Either way, Beardsley was considered to be too notorious to work with and was fired as illustrator of the Yellow Book because he was too closely associated with the now infamous Oscar Wilde, having illustrated his place for Lonely the year before his arrest. Despite this, however, his artwork is still iconic of the publication and of decadence as a whole. As we can see, the supposedly sinful and indulgent attitudes of decadent individuals were often shown to be in conflict with the social majority, and through forced amendments, censorship, imprisonment and job losses became difficult to maintain. Gaultier, who I promise we come back to, attacked precisely this tendency of critics to focus upon the rude and deviant elements of work as morally corrupting without paying attention to the beauty of the piece as a whole. He famously said, Art has no responsibility except to beauty, and should be evaluated with this mind. Unfortunately, this didn't seem to work out. So there you have it, a brief guide to decadence at the fin de siècle, a struggle against ennui, the living of life in moments, the exploration of sin, the obsession with aesthetics, and inevitably, the failure to maintain this moral lifestyle in society which just didn't allow it. I'll conclude by saying that you probably shouldn't try decadence at home, unless you really want some cake. Thank you for listening!